Welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Havi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing Russia's actions in Syria and the Middle East, developments from the G20 summit, and the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Dr. Richard White, director of the Center for Political and Military Analysis at the Hudson Institute, and Anna Borzik-Spaya, senior fellow at the Washington Institute. Thank you so much, Anna and Richard, for joining us today. Let's start by talking about Russia and Ukraine. Finally, we're seeing a showdown of some tension, obviously the kidnapping and the, you know, putting the, the sailors hostages by Russia. Um, what do you think is going to happen to this escalation? Is it just going to burst, disappear, or are we going to see a continuation of escalation between Russia and uh, Ukraine? Uh, well, I think, I think it's hard to tell, but the more likely scenario is a continuation. Uh, the fact of the matter is what's happened in Ukraine now in recent days has been building up for many months. Uh, it does, so it doesn't necessarily come as a surprise. The, it was really more of a matter of when as opposed to if something like this was going to happen. And the fact of the matter is uh, this is war. It hasn't been a frozen conflict, whatever anyone else wants you to believe. So uh, it's, I think continuation is a more likely scenario. And the question, of course, is a standoff between Russia and the West. How is this going to play out going forward? I would mm -hmm. tend to agree. I mean, the Russia strategy is just to keep the pot boiling, keep, uh, keep on raising, lowering, but within bounds, the, the objective being keep Ukraine destabilized, keep it out of NATO, keep because of reluctance to embrace an active conflict zone. Um, but not to go into an open conflict, uh, which could, you know, basically it could turn against Russia, uh, how things go. The risk is, though, there's just a big danger of miscalculation. I mean, at some point we could, as we saw with the Georgia conflict, it could just explode, even if it wasn't the original tension of either party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in case, I mean, right now we're seeing that, uh, you know, Ukraine is asking for the reserve to come out. I mean, you know, there is that... Uh, you know, they're trying to now retaliate, basically not allowing any Russians to enter um, to uh, Ukraine. But, you know, to what level can Ukraine keep doing this? And could Russia actually engage in an actual more outward, you know, military trying to seize like eastern Ukraine, for example? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, the first thing to remember is what's interesting about this incident um, is that it's not no longer little green men. You know, mm -hmm. in the past, this was Russian, more clandestine action that Russia frankly denied. Now they're not even denying it. Um, but also, I agree with Richard. I think uh, the, the Kremlin would prefer to sort of keep the pot uh, at a low boiling temperature, but not sort of have an outright explosion, because that does pose, pose risks. Um, that said, the, the, the possibility of an accident is always present when you're in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it looked like Russia had the option, as you said, seizing large parts of the rest of Ukraine mm -hmm. in about 2014. I mean, Ukrainian military wasn't, wasn't anticipating a con an active conflict with Russia, so it took them a while to get prepared. Um, when they didn't do well, the Russia had to intervene much more vigorously <laughs> in, rather than just simply relying on proxies. Um, but now the thinking is they don't have the capacity to do that without a full-scale war mobilization. Um, the Ukrainian defenses have built up. So they're just, they have this option, though, of just keeping, tr having conflicts going, keeping Donetsk peace as a, laid out as a possibility to entice Western concessions, but somehow it never managed to realize itself. I mean, Putin has now said he's going to wait for next year's Ukrainian elections for a more pliable negotiating partner. Um, but that, I'm just, you know... So that, he doesn't want to negotiate right now? Well, he, he, he doesn't, the current, he doesn't want to negotiate with the current government. He's sort of waiting for the next one to appear. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be his strategy with a lot of the Western countries. Whether he'll get, I mean, I don't know enough about Ukraine domestic politics to know um, who might be, you know, how that might turn out. But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation since Ukraine, Georgia, a few of these other countries just are stuck in the middle. They're not part of NATO, which I think is a very sturdy guarantee of Russian aggression. But they don't want to be, become part of a Moscow-led bloc, yeah. and it's just, mm -hmm. they're sort of wandering in this in this yeah. interim zone. Mm -hmm. If I could, if I could yeah. just add, what's what's very interesting about the what Russia has been doing in Ukraine is all of their efforts, in a way, uh, even though they've succeeded a lot in terms of annexing Crimea, creating this ongoing conflict. One uh, aspect where they failed is they've actually brought Ukrainians closer together. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the sense of uh, Ukrainian identity, if anything, has actually been more solidified because of, of Russian aggression. So that's mm -hmm. not going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, when we say, okay, but you know, there is that kind of um, invisible line where Russia might be pushing too far and that could turn against its own interests. How could that happen? What would the scenario look like when Russia has gone too far mm -hmm. and maybe is stuck in another uh, war that is just going to be basically uh, draining more resources and maybe more trouble internationally? Well, they seem to have problems at times controlling their proxies in eastern Ukraine. They sometimes things happen that seems to to be more than Russia would like to play in terms of its overt aggression. I mean, the Russian challenge is, okay, they've gotten some near-term gains in Crimea and, and they have a buffer in eastern Ukraine. But at the cost of alienating from uh, alienating Russia from its partners, its possible partners in the West, so it's very difficult for even governments that want to improve relations with Russia to do so, as long as Russia is actively involved in Ukraine and the other ventures we're mm -hmm. going to talk about. So that's really the cost. That's I mean, the only know, it's cost. Long, it's just the American. Yeah, but it's enormous yeah. cost. I mean, Russia mm -hmm. nat should naturally yeah. be part yeah. of yeah. Europe. It should mm -hmm. its trajectory should be like a typical. Mm -hmm. a European country, but because of this distorted foreign yeah. policy, it's sort of forcing itself off either into its own zone or into a, into a sub, you know, satellite of China. That's, mm -hmm. that's an enormous cost to the Russian people, even if it's not that immediate to the Russian, current Russian government. But I would actually, I would, I would also add the, 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 the financial cost of being involved in Ukraine was pretty costly for the Russian state, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, much more so than involvement in Syria. Um, Why? Uh, because it, you know, it's simply the, the involvement, the Russian involvement is deeper. It involved a lot more resources. Uh, the construction of this Crimean bridge was, was very costly and frankly isn't going very well. Um, so uh, the fact of the matter is the nature of involvement is far more substantial and therefore the costs are higher. And frankly, the Russian public even senses this. So some of the recent protests in Russia because of pension reform, uh, there were echoes of this, well, you've spent all this money on Crimea instead of are contributing to pensions for people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. people are, are angry about yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, it's the same, the same as in Iran. I mean, a lot of the people don't like their government wasting all this money in foreign yeah. adventures. They'd rather have it spent at home. And just, of course, their ability to express their opposition is constrained. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, would it be, what would be the best thing for Ukraine to do at this point, in your opinion? Like, I, I want to, you know. <laughs> I think their current policy makes yeah. a lot of sense, yeah. trying to move closer to the West, build up their defenses. Um, you know, at some point, there'll be a new Russian government. And, and then, you, I mean, you, the long-term solution is some kind of reconciliation between mm -hmm. Russia and Ukraine and the West. But it's difficult um, in, until we see a fundamental change in Russian policies. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really seen that, even when there were opportunities to do so, such as with President Trump's election, the, Ru the Russians didn't offer the kind of concessions that would have made a reconciliation possible. Mm -hmm. But again, at some point there'll be a new Russian government and perhaps a, a new approach to these issues. And I'd also say Ukraine is clearly on a, a pro-Western path. I don't mm -hmm. see that uh, reversing any time. I mean, they're, they're, I don't think they can reverse from mm -hmm. that. Um, in terms of other changes, perhaps uh, corruption reform. Uh, mm -hmm. In Ukraine, in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine itself, and that's been an ongoing issue in Ukraine for a long time, uh, because of the oligarchs, because of the connections to Russia. Uh, but the but the fact of the matter is, uh, Ukraine is also in a very difficult mm -hmm. position, and it's not going to revert from its pro-European path. Um, you know, when we talk, about, I mean, we saw also that you know the Ukrainian Church, the right. Orthodox uh, Orthodox Christian Church, separated itself from the uh, Russian. Yeah. Uh, church, which was like also the first in history, that yeah. made them very angry, and that was before that what happened, you yeah. know, with the uh, basically the kidnapping of uh, 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 Ukrainian uh, sailors. Do you think that uh, this is an indication of basically um, Ukraine wanting that escalation with Russia, mm -hmm. uh, basically to continue, like? Uh, is Ukraine in a position or has interest in trying to negotiate or to kind of find an actual solution with Russia at this point? Well, I think when it comes to the split with the church, this is more about 
uh, more of this issue of Ukrainian national identity uh, mm -hmm. sol being solidified because of Russian aggression in, in their country. Uh, I think this particular incident, again, was another example of how Ukrainians are asserting their own identity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I don't think this has anything to do with creating any kind of provocation mm -hmm. uh, against Russia at all. Um, and again, it shows... It's a reflection of, it's a reflection, of, the, of, the, of the reality, reality. on the ground. Uh, and it, it was a huge loss for Russia, and certainly the Kremlin was very unhappy about it. And some have speculated that these recent events may have, have, have something to do with this split. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't know that, but the fact of the matter is it was a big loss for Russia. How would you describe the uh, Western position after we saw the escalation of what Russia did? Do you think the response was appropriate? to what Russia did um, against the Ukrainian right. military ships. Yeah, I mean, I know that the, there was some criticism of the Western response not being strong enough. Um, we don't, I mean, there were public statements by the UN ambassador, the, na the national security advisor, and then eventually President Trump. Um, President Trump canceled the G20 meeting he was going to have mm -hmm. President, President Putin. The, the Russians were really eager yeah. for that meeting. They, you know, they've always they've always been striving to to, to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings and the illusion that somehow they'll, yeah. you know, Putin's There's magic will. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, but uh, um, so he's going to be telling was, President Trump what to do, basically. Right, that's right, that's right, the, yeah, right. what they try to say. Right. <laughs> but I mean, the long-term strategy has been pretty effective. It's been slowly increasing the support for the Ukrainian government. Initially, it was uh, a non-lethal assistance. The mm -hmm. current administration is now providing more lethal systems. Uh, there have been major exercises involved in Ukraine, the U.S. and Western capacity to reinforce Ukraine militarily is going well. So I think that, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's as far as I think as you would reasonably expect without doing something that might backfire. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of economics, uh, they've been trying to give Ukraine aid, and as I think Anya said, it's key to also yeah. improve and reform the, the Ukraine's internal structures to make sure that the money is spent effective. So I can't say that the U.S. strategy, let, in partnership with its Europe, with Europeans, has not has been ineffective. I think it's mm -hmm. worked pretty well. Um, I mean, there's some things just beyond the capacity of the U.S. to do for now. For example, bring Ukraine into NATO or, or recover Crimea for. Ukraine, but uh, you know, those options are, you know, will we'll just remain open until circumstances improve. What do you think, Anna? I mean, do you think that uh, American response for now, before we go to Europe, yeah. uh, the American response, as Richard just said, you know, canceling the meeting yeah. between President Trump and Putin, was that a big blow? I, absolutely. I mean, look, I would also say, you know, perhaps it would have been better to have a quicker response. You know, we can think back and see what we could have done you know, more effectively and more coherently. Certainly there was a little bit of that wishy-washiness, but the fact of the matter is uh, the meeting was canceled, mm -hmm. um, and it was clear Putin didn't like it. You saw the response in the Russian press afterwards, uh, which is always a very good indicator of how the Kremlin feels about these things. It was a big snub, and it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and as Richard said, uh, more aid to Ukraine, including lethal weapons, uh, sanctions, and there's more talk of sanctions going forward. So if you assess the actual tangible results, uh, the response has been uh, progressively more hawkish, not less. Mm -hmm. The other issue is, uh, I think sometimes Putin um, uh, underestimates or mis misunderstands uh, how the West will respond to his mm -hmm. actions, because certainly his, uh, um, the Western response to aggression in Georgia was far softer than the response to Crimea. So there's this, um, if you trace our uh, w uh, response from Georgia to Crimea, it's been always on the upswing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if he necessarily counted on that. Yeah, he, he doesn't have a strategy to counter yeah. on that. Um, I want to move to uh, basically uh, Russia and Syria. Um, in your opinion, do you think right now we have, you know, Dimastura, the person who was in charge of, you know, basically uh, the envoy from the United Nations, people looked at him as somebody who's the envoy of Putin. That was uh, some people's accusations mm -hmm. uh, against Dimastura. Um, now he came out empty-handed. Empty There's no plan, basically, uh, for any ending of the conflict in Syria. Do you think that Russia has its own plans at this point that nobody knows about? I think that goal. I mean, I think you know they basically want to restore a Syrian government control led by Assad or someone that you know they, they, it was a, they consider a partner 
to all of Syria and limit and, and basically push out the U.S. and other forces. I know that's the goal. How they're getting there, I mean, some of it has been more effective than, than you know, I, you, you, I would have thought or would have hoped, you know, in terms of basically being able to work with the Iranians and, and Hezbollah and the Syrians, basically turn the tide of the, mil, of the war. I mean, I think it looked like when the time that the Russian intervention, the Assad was going to fall. Mm -hmm. um, and they clearly reversed that through, uh, through, through their intervention. Um, and the government's forces are much more effective now. But going to that next stage, I mean, as long as there are U.S. troops in the country, um, that, limit, that limits their possibilities to, to assert control over all of Syria. And then a P, any kind of enduring peace settlement, let alone economic reconstruction, is going to be very difficult given Russia's limited assets uh, without some kind of Western involvement. Um, and they're still straddling with the Iran question. I mean, you know, as we know, Russian-Iranian relations, as you know, probably yeah. better than any of yes. us, are very complicated. <laughs> um, and they're, you know, it's not always clear if they want the Iranians out or how they would get them out or what they're willing to do and how much pressure they put on Assad. They say different things at different times. Mm -hmm. So what that strategy is is a bit ambiguous. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Anna? Um, well, I think um, a couple of things. Uh, what's interesting is Russia remains a necessary intermediary mm -hmm. in Syria. And uh, whether uh, uh, those involved agree or disagree with Russia, unfortunately, that, that is the reality and that's, uh, that is a success that they can claim, even mm -hmm. despite their recent uh, setbacks uh, mm -hmm. in Syria. Um, uh, the, uh, the recent decision of the United States to remain in Syria beyond simply combating ISIS uh, is, is, is a setback for them, uh, and they, they're clearly very unhappy about it. Um, and it's a win for us uh, in terms of uh, working to try to curb Russia's negative influence in Syria. But the fact of the matter is we have a very long way to go because Russia is the, the broker. Uh, Russia has a permanent military presence mm -hmm. uh, in Syria for at least the next 49 years. Um, the, the big question also, as Richard said, is reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, unfortunately, Assad, um, uh, Assad is not leaving. We, we see that very mm -hmm. clearly, uh, and it's very depressing. Mm -hmm. um, but the big he's not leaving now. That's right. He's not yeah. leaving now. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is reconstruction uh, and issues like return of refugees. Uh, Russia cannot really do any of this. They they like status, but they don't like responsibility, and they don't have the resources to mm -hmm. contribute to this. So, the big question is how is this going to play out in the months ahead with with these uh, with these issues. Russia is trying to leverage refugee issues with mm -hmm. the Europeans, I would say more like threatening than leveraging, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, well, there's little appetite in Europe for, for investment, so I'm not really sure where this is going, but the fact of the matter is Russia has this position that mm -hmm. they've carved out for themselves, and they're not leaving. Uh, the United States also said now that they don't want, they want to eliminate the Sochi and the Asitano right. processes. Okay. Um, what does that, what is, the indication of this American uh, clear position now on those two other processes that Russia was trying to promote for the last few years. Well, it's also uh, it's also a, a loss for Russia if that happens because the Astana and Sochi process was created not to not to create a real solution, but simply to sign in the United States and, and create another alternative uh, track that instead promoted uh, Iran, uh, Assad, and those in the opposition that did not. Um, object to Assad's departure. So, if this new initiative gains traction, I think that would be a big that would be a win for the United States and also for hopefully a better resolution for Syria. Yeah, they've been they've been having setbacks even within the limited four. You remember they had a summit with the in, in Istanbul with the Europeans, mm -hmm. not the U.S., but that didn't seem to go too well. They're they're having difficulty with Turkey, um, mm -hmm. as we all are, but at least in this case, <laughs> yeah. getting Turkey to sign on to you know what the Russian vision is for Syria is, is not proved possible. Um, you know, so I guess the alternative is, is through the UN process, but I mean, it's still, we don't really have the preconditions yet. I mean, the, we, we may have a, 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 a stalemate in the military situation after, in, in terms of the U.S. during presence, but how are we going to get to the peace process, reconstruction, whatever the four is just not clear. Uh, when we talked about the American new position of, you know, we're staying in Syria for now. Uh, until the Iranians are out of Syria. This is a pre, you know, big condition because how the Iranians are going to get out of Syria, nobody knows. Uh, do you think Russia has a tactic to deal with this new strategy by the United States? And how are they going to be trying to meddle between having their ally, Iran, in mm -hmm. Syria, 
but then at the same time, you know, need to continue and to have some sort of relationship with the United States? Well, I think they're counting uh, on their, a couple of things, I think they're counting on their position of sort of the indispensable power broker with everybody. Uh, because that has been the Putin approach to the region. Uh, he wanted to build relationships with all major government and opposition groups. And um, begrudgedly, many in the region, um, uh, and even frankly in the United States, uh, accept, again, that Russia is there to stay. They have this position. And whether we like it or not, we have to talk to, to Russia. And I think that they're counting on this position of an intermediary. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be trying, you know, they may try eventually play the card of, well, we'll help get Iran out of Syria. Uh, I don't see how they can possibly do that. I frankly don't think they want to do it either. I also don't think they have any leverage over Iran, really. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that's, that that may be their strategy or plan going forward is to try to play this in broker, this intermediary, mm -hmm. in the effort to at least buy some time. Buying time. That's yeah. the yeah, only They may objective. anticipate and change a U.S. policy. I mean, mm -hmm. at times, U.S. policy has been, you know, not uh, fickle, as in the Middle East, we might say, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. not, not, you know, not willing to, to keep for, forces indefinitely in yeah. the country. I mean, we had an administration that would probably have been already walking out of Syria. Right, and President yeah, Trump would, I mean, he said yeah. everything would be equal. He'd like to get the troops yeah. out of Syria, Afghanistan, and mm -hmm. Iraq, yeah. and so on. But, and you know, we have elections after a few years, yeah. so yeah. I mean, yeah. that, that's the long yeah. and short-term game. Yeah. A plank could change. Exactly. So they may, they may just anticipate weighing us out, and that might solve the immediate problem of the U.S. troop presence, but it doesn't solve more yeah. the yeah. enduring problems of both political and economic. Yeah you know, solutions to be able to stabilize their, their preeminent position in Syria. But Russia does have leverage over Assad. I mean, doesn't Russia has the main leverage over the life or death and safety, yeah, I, not I safety would, of Bashar al-Assad? I, I would say it does because, you know, if, I mean, frankly, look, Assad owes his regime survival to the Russians. So. Uh, not to the Iranians. Uh, not to, uh, not, well, both to Russians and the Iranians, but really in... 2013, he owed more to the Iranians. In 2015, it was the Russians who mm -hmm. saved him. Absolutely. Yeah. So, no, I think he he does. And you could actually you could actually see it. You know, in, in Putin's uh, trips to Syria, you could even see how Assad was sort of sidelined. Mm -hmm. I mean, Assad is not even uh, Assad and Syrian representatives are often not even present at these Astana negotiations. You can sort of see that they're just told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I suspect Assad is not an easy uh, partner uh, mm -hmm. for anybody to work with, including the Russians. Um, and uh, it's hard to see how leverage over Assad would necessarily translate into leverage over Iran. I mean, perhaps mm -hmm. that's possible, but I'm just not exactly sure how that yeah. might happen. I mean, I'm just, the question is, it's like, who has more leverage over right. Assad? Is it Russia or is it Iran at this point? It's like, mm -hmm. who's in charge of his safety? Who's in charge of, you know, his protection? I mean, Assad has the advantage now is he's not dependent on either of them, so he can maybe play them off. So it's possible that at times Russia and Spishman were could have told Assad to leave and been able to force him out. Mm -hmm. But now he can turn to the Iranians to help him, and vice versa. If he gets pressure mm -hmm. from Iran, he has pressure. So he's in a bit of a better position mm -hmm. playing off his patrons. Do you, you know? agree with that, that he is not in need of both of them? Well, I think, like well I, I think he needs patrons, but I also think that, that he is playing them off each other a little mm -hmm. bit. I and mean, there's definitely that element going on. Um, I mean, Assad himself is actually alone, is in a fairly weak military position uh, in Syria. Um, you know, he's talked for a while about regaining all of Syria, but um, his own forces are quite depleted. Uh, some analysts have suggested that one of the one of several reasons why he resorts to use of chemical weapons is not, uh, in addition to the moralizing uh, demoralizing factor, is also because he frankly doesn't have other weapons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, and plus it's one thing to take a territory, it's quite another to hold a territory, and Assad doesn't have the ability by himself to hold territory. Mm -hmm. But it's also clear that he feels very confident. Uh, we saw him driving around Damascus with his shirt open. Yes, um, the uh, propaganda videos. The propaganda saw, videos, yes. exactly. Um, there, was, there were these very interesting recent, um, oh, I think it was over the summer where he admitted uh, to uh, the killings in the in the in the infamous Sydney prison, whereas before all of these killings were kept secret, mm -hmm. which also suggested a degree of confidence. And you know what I conclude from that, given his own weak position, is that he feels confident in both Russian and Iranian backing. What is the Russia, uh, the European position on Russia, in terms of Ukraine? Was this response? strong enough uh, about those, you know, uh, basically um, breaking international laws uh, against Ukraine and then obviously in Syria and uh, elsewhere. 
You know, it's been better than sometimes we, I think we make it sound. I think on the whole, mm -hmm. NATO, EU has been pretty good about lots of keeping sanctions on Russia, mm -hmm. um, rolling them over. I mean, clearly divided. There's some European governments that would like to improve relations with Russia, Hungary, Italy, mm -hmm. I think a yeah. handful. Yes. But it's not the majority sentiment, and it hasn't been enough to, to deflect you know, the, the overall <laughs> policies. Um, Iran, it's a little worse, uh, but you know we've managed. Uh, you know, I think the Trump administration is really skilled about what it's more than I, I would have. I, I, I thought might have been possible getting getting international, uh, getting an international consensus, or at least a lot of countries behind it, not 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 willing to challenge the sanctions too strongly. I mean, the mm -hmm. Europeans talk about these new mechanisms and so on, but they don't appear to be making much progress. The actual European companies are leaving. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, despite what the governments say in terms of what the actual European policies are and what the private sector is doing, it's, it's, I think it's more it's different. Good one. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think in terms of uh, yeah. Russia and Ukraine, Russia and Syria? You know, I, I would agree with Richard. On the whole, on the whole, there has been um, you know, the, the stance on the position on, on Russia has been fairly tough, but individual countries, like you said, Italy is one, certainly Hungary. Um, they raise uh, questions about what's going to happen with Russia going forward. So there's been, and it's very hard, I think, for Europe as a whole to come together on these issues because there's no, um, uh, there's no one uh, European foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's going to be interesting going forward is what's going to happen with Nord Stream Two, uh, especially now that Angela Merkel uh, has mm -hmm. announced that she's going to be leaving uh, mm -hmm. fairly soon. Um, and the Nord Stream 2 project, I think, uh, whether or not it would be possible to perhaps um, muster any sanctions against mm -hmm. Nord Stream 2 or, you know, curb Russian uh, energy influence through Europe uh, through this Can project. you talk about this project a little bit more? Um, do, do, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, um, in, broad, in broad strokes, um, uh, Russia's interest uh, um, uh, and, and sort of, uh, how do you put this, Russia controls or attempts to seek control of European politics through energy. Uh, and uh, at least about a third of Russia of European energy comes from Russia. Um, uh, Ru uh, Europe has been working in recent years to try to reduce its dependence on Russian energy, but that there's and there has been some progress in that regard, but it still has a long way to go. So Nord Stream Two is uh, an effort for Russia to regain some of that influence through energy, so provision of energy to Europe. Yeah, the, 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 uh, what Russia has been doing is been picking some key Russian partners. Nord Stream 2 is Germany, mm -hmm. there's uh, there are southern partners, and the, so getting a few countries to sign on and take their oil and then distribute mm -hmm. to the rest of Europe. And the countries that object most strongly, you know, the Poles, because they're in the middle of enduring Russia, their ability to, to block these is limited since they, they, these pipelines often go through the sea or go mm -hmm. around their territory. Um, the administration, the U.S. administration, has taken a stronger stance against some of these, and that yeah. it may at yeah. some point influence things. I guess the other variable in Europe I'm interested in is what happens when the British leave the mm -hmm. EU. Because, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, there have always been a, a pro-American force within the EU. So mm -hmm. if they're out, does that shift yeah. the balance? Of course, it depends a lot on what happens after Merkel and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in OPEC? Because also now we know that Qatar wants to leave. They just announced that, that they're going to be uh, leaving next year. Yeah. Uh, the dr uh, prices have dropped tremendously. That's $62 a barrel. Um, when, you know, they were 80, what would Russia do with OPEC and knowing that Russia relies on oil yeah. as its yeah. main revenue? Well, what's what an interesting and also somewhat worrisome dynamic is Russia has been sort of solidifying its role uh, as a de facto almost member of OPEC. Uh, the cooperation with Saudi Arabia on this front that we've seen, it's been uh, building up for, for many months now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you saw this very disturbing, frankly, high five <laughs> over, the yes. G20, <laughs> over the weekend at the G20. Oh, yes, I'm not sure if mean. it was kind of a, a mix between a high five and, <laughs> and a handshake. Yeah. Um, it was, I mean, it was pretty disturbing to, to watch. Mm. Um, and like Putin was like reaffirming yes. that, yeah. that relationship. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't connection. need to worry about domestic opinion or whatever. Yeah. So he can, you know, he can yeah. be nice to anybody he wants to. It doesn't seem affect him but yeah. yeah he wants to say hey I'm, I'm like here now you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm taking the the role of the yeah. United States yeah, yeah but and, and I think it was a message too it was a message frankly to both the West and it was a message to everybody yeah. else who was watching. yeah I think yeah. one thing Russia's challenge though is that while it has a good position in Syria beyond that 
you know, it's still not, mm -hmm. their influence has been very constrained, you know, yeah. so they may have Thai, mm -hmm. they may have, you know, some influence in Iraq or with the Saudis mm -hmm. or, or even, I guess, they're going to sell some weapons to the Kuwaitis, but it's nowhere near the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Russian challenge is even if they have Syria as their bastion, going beyond that to other countries they've been trying for Libya, which are, you know, for mm -hmm. to end, and, and, but it's just, it's their We're capacity and, and is, inf is limited because they're mm -hmm. searching. In Syria, they have a distinct advantage that the U.S. doesn't really have, have a strong partner um, through its, probably through its own faulty policies, mm -hmm. but at, the, at this point, you know, they, 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 they've got, uh, they have a, you know, a global partner, Assad, that they can work with, the Iranians, mm -hmm. and so on. They don't have that kind of combination elsewhere, and so they're struggling, right. be it through energy, arms, or that's mm -hmm. pretty much what they have to rely on, or proxies to, to carve out. But so far, it's just, it's my general assessment is pretty limited beyond Syria. It's, you know what, it's limited, but the thing is, it, uh, here's the thing, the U.S. has been retreating from the region mm -hmm. uh, for quite some time now, mm -hmm. and um, it's been fairly easy for Russia to make inroads, not because the Middle East is this grand arena of competition the way it was during the Cold War, but because the other side simply chose not to engage, mm -hmm. um, and the other side being the United States. And um, unfortunately, uh, many in the region, rightly or wrongly, even begrudgingly, have come to see Putin as a more reliable uh, uh, individual who backs up his friends unconditionally. Um, whereas the United States, you know, there's a lot of ambivalence about what is U.S. policy in the region. There's a lot of hedging bets. And so Egypt has increasingly turned to, to Russia. Um, frankly, even Morocco, uh, mm -hmm. you know, an American ally has con recently concluded a number of agreements with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so I would actually say um, they are making inroads and largely they're capitalizing on American retreat that's been ongoing for, mm -hmm. for quite some time. The U.S. has a far more robust mm -hmm. uh, structure in the region, but it hasn't been using it. Mm -hmm. But how economically would Russia be affected by the prices of oil and basically the uh, possibility of OPEC disappearing from the, you know, collapsing? Well, no, uh, oil, Russia, oil prices matter greatly for Russia. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that has always been the case and that's not going to change uh, anytime soon. I I'm sure that is on Putin's mind. I'm not sure if OPEC is necessarily in danger of complete collapse, although I'm not a specialist on, mm -hmm. yeah. on, on OPEC. Um, oh, but I also think... Um, uh, these, um, you know, these arms deals to the region, uh, which Putin has increased because of Syria, has also been helping him sustain things like Saudi investments mm -hmm. uh, in Russia. So there is still an element of capitalism to Russia, which is fairly limited, but it, it produces these injections mm -hmm. to sort of... Um, sort of let the economy uh, at least stumble. It's not, mm -hmm. clearly it's not doing well, but it's also not in, at a point of collapse. Exactly. Um, you wouldn't like to add anything to that, Richard? No, I, think I agree with um, <clears throat> What about the Turkish-Russian relationship? Because that's a very important strategical <clears throat> relationship to both countries. It was a lot of ups and downs. Lately, we saw, obviously, the Idlib province and uh, Turkey taking uh, the position of just, you know, we're there, we're not going to let anybody, um, you know, uh, attack it, obviously, with the help of the Trump's administration. Um, but where is that relationship now where is it heading what's going to happen in this particular issue right i think russia scored an own goal a couple of years ago when they seemed to go after the turks after the shoot down of you know their, mm -hmm. their war plane over syria and it was very it was much more stronger than i thought mm -hmm. more and mm -hmm. it would have expected someone like a rational calculator such as president putin to do but they since they reversed that erdogan's conveniently found somebody to take the blame for the shoot down it wasn't the turkish government um but the Turkeys is difficult for Russia, I think, for all of us. I mean, the Turks are, in some areas, we all, each, the Europeans, the Russians, the Americans can cooperate with Turkey, mm -hmm. and other areas not. Syria is clearly one we're all having problems with, and I think the Russians are, are finding this, too. The Turks aren't willing to sign on to their plan for Syria, you know, without changes, reservations that they're, they haven't been able to make. Um, you know that that said, it's uh, it's it's certainly I think I, Turkey has been more alienated from the U.S. than I would like. I would like to bring them a little closer to, to you know pull them a little more away from Russia, but it's mm -hmm. still limited. You know, there's an there's a, there's a very interesting element, a sort of dynamic of the Russian Turkish relationship also, and that has to do with the Kurdish uh, issue. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, and it's not new. Uh, uh, Russia has, uh, the Kremlin especially, has very deep connections uh, to the Kurds that go back, frankly, to Catherine the Great. Mm -hmm. um, and historically, the Kremlin used uh, the Kurdish card uh, against its, its adversaries, particularly against Turkey. And I think mm -hmm. there's a, that, that dynamic has been playing out throughout. Uh, with the PKK? With the PKK, PYD office opening in Moscow, mm -hmm. for example. And it happened, if you notice, exactly after that episode with the downing of, of the Russian plane. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, frankly, I think in this relationship, Putin uh, has more leverage over Turkey than the other way around, because mm -hmm. we certainly saw Erdogan come across on, on Putin's side, on Assad's position. He mm -hmm. has long since stopped saying that Assad must go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for them, and that's because for Turkey, the Kurdish issue is, is very critical. And I think Putin uses that quite skillfully. There's also the issue of Russian uh, tourists, which uh, are huge. Um, a portion of the Turkish economy, and we, again, we saw that Putin sort of turned that tap off mm -hmm. uh, with the temporary standoff with the Russian plane mm -hmm. uh, shutdown. And uh, I think, in some ways, Turkey is almost falling into Russian trap more than mm -hmm. it realizes. And, and as Richard said, it is pretty isolated. Um, but I also think um, having Turkey where it is in NATO. Uh, to some extent is more of an advantage to Putin be, in terms of seeding chaos as opposed mm -hmm. to inter having Turkey leave NATO. Exactly. Um, Israel also went ahead and launched more airstrikes against uh, Iranian militias positions uh, in Syria after the, the you know Russia delivered the S-300 missiles and defense system to the Assad regime. What type of message do you think uh, Israel was sending and uh, you know it basically shows that they're either not working or that they are just turned off with the right. well, it's, it, I mean, it's going to take a while for the Syrians to learn how to use yeah. the system, <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless they're yeah. manned by Russian yeah. soldiers. But I think at the point that at this point, they've given them the systems, but it's, they, they basically have to train the Syrians how to use them, and, and it's going to take a, take a while. So mm -hmm. Israel has a, a window of opportunity. But I think more importantly, you're right, it's a message that Israel is not, despite um, the incident where the Syrians shot down a Russian plane because it, they thought it was, it was an Israeli plane. Um, the Israelis are still going to insist on attacking at least Hezbollah targets and Iranian targets in Syria. Um, I would think the Israelis can also overcome this system. Mm -hmm. I remember the Lebanese war, they were able to overcome, or even going back to the, to the, uh, the Southern Tree War, it was a challenge, but eventually they were able to overcome the the air defense systems that the Russians had provided, and I would think the U.S. is helping them do that. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, Anna? You know, the what's the Israeli position, and what would the Russian position be today? You know, after yeah. they saw the attack against the Iranian militias. You know, I, I agree with Richard. I mean, I, uh, and uh, it, first of all, it would take a really long time for Syrians to learn how to operate the S-300. They've been uh, flying the S-200 since, what, the 80s, and they still mm -hmm. managed to <laughs> prove themselves absolutely incompetent mm -hmm. and shoot, shoot down a Russian plane. Yeah. So I think, I suspect the, the Russian trust in the Syrians is quite low. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, it was a message, uh, mm -hmm. and also uh, the S-300. An Israeli message. An Israeli, and it was a message, for, in Isra exactly, both sides are messaging, uh, mm -hmm. me messaging here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's critical. It's a matter of, of, of uh, you know, Israel and, um, excuse me, Iran and Hezbollah are an existential threat for Israel, mm -hmm. and they're not going to compromise mm -hmm. um, on these issues. But what you also observe is how carefully Israel is working with the Russians mm -hmm. on this issue. The, the um, um, uh, uh, w w you know, the, the, the Russian response, all this, this bluster and anger that came out against Israel, uh, was response, mm -hmm. uh, contrast that to a very measured, quiet, um, a careful response that came from Israel. Uh, the Russian ambassador recently made a, gave a fairly long lecture in Israel and again reiterated this issue of, um, of, of, of Russian, I guess I forget how he phrased it, sort of concern or uh, basically disapproval of, of, what he, of what Russia considers mm -hmm. uh, improper Israeli behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that, um, I think everybody knows that Israel will continue with their strikes. It's just a matter of messaging again on both sides. And, Russia was asserting its dominance. It was a political message by sending mm -hmm. the S-300. Uh, yes, Russia. But uh, yeah, it seems that Israel is not really just listening to this message. They are not responding well, by comments, but well, by action. Well, what they're, I mean, they're listening, but, and they're responding. They're sort of, Israel is a very tough position. Russia is on their border. Um, and they see it as a stronger power. Mm -hmm. um, and they also feel that they can't count on the United States the way they could historically. Mm -hmm. So I think they're just playing a very delicate balancing act. Do you think Russia is, is uh, stronger than Israel militarily? 
Because that uh, well, was a, that's in general, an yes, question. but in but in I mean in the I mean it's hard I've for me to who see. Said no. Right. I mean it's hard it's, in it's in the Middle East. I don't. You know. Then it's it's it's. I think the scenario we're looking at though is very unlikely. I can't see a Russian. Israeli direct military yeah. clash. I think it's more, you know, the Israelis are thinking, well, we have some diplomatic options with Russia. There's a large Russian community in Israel. We have some ties with Putin. Putin, you know, Netanyahu goes to Moscow periodically mm -hmm. to try and win over Putin on the Iranians. Um, on the other hand, uh, as Anya said, you know, they can't really count on the Russians to help them deliver the Iranians, and they can't count on the U.S., so they have to yeah. show that they can deal with themselves. So I think they're just basically using limited force to attack those critical targets they see in Syria, but avoiding, despite the accident, they've you know they've generally at least told the Russians what they're going to do, and, and then avoided attacking Russian personnel and vice versa. The Russians haven't tried to shoot down Israeli planes over Syria and so on. I expect that to continue, with the caveat being because of what happened, some of those mechanisms are a little weaker. Mm -hmm. So you know, I can't I can't really see in a war between you know any, any anything even anything like the 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 seventy you know the seventy a war of attrition where there was Israelis shooting down Russian pilots. I just don't mm -hmm. see that yet. I think that's more that they both have tools, military, diplomatic, and so on. They're trying to use them, mm -hmm. um, and Israel is in a tough yeah. position. I mean, there's no really great outcome in this area yeah. mm -hmm. for them. Uh, I want to move to Libya because it seems that Russia is basically investing right now in Libya to be, and you told me earlier before the show, both agreed yeah. that it's been happening yeah. for a while now. But we saw it now more openly, uh, talking about possible uh, Russian military base in Libya, basically also taking advantage of the American absence mm -hmm. uh, in a place like Libya. What is the potential for Russia in a country like Libya, geographically a little bit further? Yeah. Uh, closer to Europe, yeah, and uh, has oil too. Yeah, no, and those are um, there. There's a, there's a lot of potential, and the key thing is is exactly what you said, and that's U.S. absence. Um, it's in there are a lot of uh, differences between Syria and a lot of interesting similarities. Certainly, it's a you know it's it's not an ongoing military conflict, um, so there's no reason for Russia to come in guns blazing and create mm -hmm. another intervention the way they had in Syria. Um, instead, there's potential for, potential for Russia to become uh, a peace broker. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, in the context of Western absence, uh, particularly the United States and also certain European countries, uh, perhaps welcoming uh, mm -hmm. the Russian role. Uh, it, especially Italy, especially, that has exactly. a lot of influence in, in Libya. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, but Libya is so fractured. So complicated. I mean, the Russians can side with one faction, but there's like an, an automatic. Yeah, there's an automatic counterbalance in the other faction. Mm -hmm. So I'm, my expectation is the Russians are going to have as diff much difficulty as the Europeans and the Americans in trying to form a you know coherent pro uh, faction in Libya behind them that's able to dominate the country. So you know, it's, the Russians clearly have some role in trying to expand that, but I think their potential is limited. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's, I think the Russians are also being very careful in Libya. You don't see, um, you know, for, for years now, there's been very quiet and careful steps that they've taken, but they also, I think, recognize that it's a very complicated uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So they want to have access. Um, I think it's a matter of sort of figuring out the right time on how to, uh, how to do it because it is, it is very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, the potential, the potential is there because it's, it is oil, um, mm -hmm. it's a huge economy, it's a, it's a major country in North Africa, access to the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. um, well, uh, potential port access, which is certainly something that Russia sought. And, you know, once you have um, a good relations with Egypt and Libya, you can certainly see strategically, especially with Algeria already being in Russia's camp. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's also a natural segue into the rest of Africa. We see Russia active there as well. Um, it is a delicate situation, and I suspect that's why we see these periodic blips of Russian activity, but it's also sort of not, hasn't yet materialized. Yeah, yeah. but this is very familiar. This reminds me of the Soviet period. You know, mm -hmm. they tried to line up with Nasser and Gaddafi and, and the others, but, yes. you know, that it's just hard to maintain that kind of coalition. Yeah. Um, we saw also, like, there's a, co a private uh, Russian company, so nothing is... Uh, yeah. Private in Russia, exactly. Probably. Nothing is actually private. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a company called Wagner. That's yes. right, the Wagner. Yeah. 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 So they're like wanting. Uh, is there? Could we see actually the establishment of, of like openly Russian companies taking yeah, our contracts? I mean, the thing is, those companies. I mean, technically, they're. I mean, they appear to be 
tied to various groups in Russia. Mm -hmm. So like Putin. there appears to well no, and actually <laughs> not. So there appears to be some rivalry between these groups and the main military. And so remember there was that incident in Syria where the US attacked and killed all those yes. Russians and but it yes. wasn't the, they weren't but the Russian tense ministry didn't do anything because they seemed they to... They were paramilitary. Right, and, yeah. they were, and potentially rivals to the conventional military. We don't fully understand it. It's very yeah, confusing because yeah. technically they're legal in Russia um, and sometimes they, they appear to support Russian interests, particularly in Ukraine, but sometimes they appear to fight with each other, these various groups, and, mm -hmm. and be a bit... It's, it's and, like messy. It's yeah, like, so like it's, a, it probably reflects, which I, which I also don't understand very well, the, the power rivalries within Russia itself. Some of these are tied to various groups within Russia, not necessarily President Putin and the, and the conventional military. Do you agree with that? It's not necessarily Putin. I think it's. I certainly think it's possible. I mean, the fact of the matter is, we just don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's so much. Uh, it's so opaque because mm -hmm. the regime is so opaque. Um, one of what, one thing I thought was very interesting is in September of this year, Putin uh, signed an, a decree uh, about what he called um, non-staff um, intelligence officers. Mm -hmm. uh, about sort of make, creating this term almost, making it a, a kind of a legal entity within, uh, within the Russian government. And the way it was phrased in Russian, uh, that, that sort of non-staff uh, intelligence officer, for mm -hmm. an intelligence officer, it sounded like a euphemism for a contractor. Okay. Uh, and certainly we see, you know, all the secrecy surrounding these individuals and how they sort of um, operate uh, with connections with the Russian defense ministry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, many Russian journalists who investigate them uh, have ended up dead, uh, as we know. And, um, there, you know, also the, the possibility of differences between Putin and the Russian defense ministry. But we actually saw that playing out a little bit after the um, shooting of the Aleutian 20 incident, which also kind of, I, I don't know for certain. Um, I have a lot of questions about it. Uh, power rivalries certainly are a possibility. I don't think... Uh, I, I don't think Putin's control is so strong that there's no rivalry underneath. Mm -hmm. It's just that we don't know a lot. We don't know a lot about it. Yeah. I think we'll end it at, uh, you know, here because we're out of time. But thank you so much, Anna and uh, Richard, for joining us. Love to have you in the future. Great. Thank you. Thanks. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for sticking with us. Good night.